motherfucker. Oh no. <laughs> oh, we're missing something. Hold on. Uh, hmm. I think we're missing something. Yeah. Well, I gotta fix that. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Ask the King. Sorry about that. <laughs> Sorry about the botched intro. Um, oops. Today is January 26, 2023. This is my first episode of Ask the King of the new year. All right. It is actually episode 94. Yes, we are really getting up there in the episodes of Ask the King. I've been doing this show for over a decade. Did you see the new picture that was in the intro montage there? It said 14 years of Ask the King. I mean, it wasn't always called Ask the King, but technically I have been doing this show um, for 14 years. Holy moly. That's a long time. You could go back to each Ask the King and see me change. You could see my body type change from bloated to skinnier. You could see my hair get older and grayer. You could see my jowls get bigger and flappier. <sighs> Actually, it's not true. I think my jowls are just the same. But anyway, oh um, man, this is by far my longest running show that I've ever done on the internet. Welcome one and welcome all. I hope that you're ready for some fun Q&A today. Uh, the intro, here's what happened. So I always use that male motherfucker intro, right? Um, recently, what I did is I migrated a lot of my resources off of my local hard drive that has the OS on it to my side storage hard drive. I was basically trying to make the computer run a little better. Um, and so I, I you know, copy-pasted a lot of stuff over, and I thought that I had gotten everything working. I guess I had forgotten that video clip because I'm clicking on it. I'm like, here comes the intro. <laughs> so obviously I screwed something up, right? That's supposed to be the clip that says, man, motherfucker. I screwed it up. Sorry about that. I will do my best. Um, I will do my best to try to fix that. If I can't, I guess we already have a good intro anyway with the 14 years of, uh, the 14 years of Ask the King, right? So anyway, welcome everyone to the show. This is part one. This might be a three-parter. We'll see if it's a two-parter or a three-parter. We have many questions to answer, questions from everywhere. We got questions from patrons, questions from channel members, questions from those who posted on my forums on dspgaming.com, and yes, even Twitter questions. Will we have time to ask the stream chat for questions today? I don't know. Depends on how long it takes to answer the questions I already have here. But I love doing this show. I do it every other month. All right. And uh, if you're interested in getting your questions answered on the next episode of Ask the King, there's many ways you can do so. Method number one would be become a channel member. Channel members always get priority access to get your questions answered on the show. The vast majority of questions, like no exaggeration, one... Two, two out of the four pages of questions, two and a half pages have been taken from members. So if that doesn't convince you to become a channel member, get your questions answered on Ask the King, I'm not sure what else would. That's a huge, you know, asset to the show, okay? Now, in addition to that, if you become a patron, $20 patron pledge, all right, definitely will earn you a guaranteed answer on the show. We have one person who actually took advantage of that this time that will be answering their questions. Um, outside of that, you can post up on my forums, the King of Hate. Excuse me. Wow. Excuse me. That's the old site that's been defunct for over a year. DSPgaming.com. All right. DSPgaming.com. And the link's already live. If you type exclamation point Ask the King into the stream chat, the link will pop up. You can click and you can already go to the next show two months later, the end of March. All right. There you go. You can post up your questions there. And, of course, thanks to those who posted a few questions up on my Twitter uh, this morning as well. All right. So here's the deal. Here's how it works. I answer your questions. You enjoy. Now, if you contribute during the show, I will still shout out your contributions. I will still have pop-up animations. All right? All that's still going to happen. Same where we hit 100 likes today. I'm still going to do a celebratory bubble blow. It's not like just because we're doing Ask the King, everything changed. However, obviously one thing that did change is that I'm already wearing a hat. And usually what happens is if we hit $100 of support on any stream, I'll put on a hat. Well, I already got one on. So instead of that, if we hit $100 of support, we'll have a vest. You guys will get to vote on a type of vest for me to wear for the rest of the show. It kind of jumps to the next level of reward. It makes sense. All right, I hope that that's fine for you guys. Also, my first time doing Ask the King with the new lighting setup. What do you guys think? 
right? Different, huh? You can actually see the Pac-Man ghost, which is really neat. I have no idea how well everything else is standing out in the background. I now have a ring light. I no longer use that crappy college-style dorm room light that I used for like over a decade. Now I'm using better, more professional lighting here. So I hope that the show looks good to you. Some people are saying you can't really tell the difference. That's because we're using a backlight that's very similar to the color of how the office used to look anyway. So I hope that it's entertaining to you guys. All right? All right. Without further ado, I think it's time for us to jump in and start answering all of your questions. Sounds good? Um, so, let's do this. Muckman in the chat says, I actually bought Callisto Protocol. Only 49 bucks. So it was cheaper based on your feedback. And I'm glad I did because it's an enjoyable game. Thumbs up. That's what it's all about, my friend. Thank you for sharing that. All right. Let's get to questions. Our first questions are from Slayer. He is the patron who took advantage of his patronage this month. Patreon.com forward slash dark side Phil, by the way, if you want to check it out. And he asked two questions. I'm going to be honest with Slayer. <clears throat> I'm going to do my best to answer them, but I don't think I can answer them as well as he thinks I can answer them. All right? You'll see what I mean when I read the questions. Question number one. After watching the videos of the hardest K-pop dances for the patron private reactions, what are your thoughts on the choreography dances and the difficulty and complexity in general based on what you saw so far and comparing to American pop? Just to clarify, in the video you had the impression that the hardest K-pop dances are based on hard-hitting moves, but hard K-pop dances are actually based on the difficulty to execute the dance based on how hard the dance is. Executing the dance correctly based on the concept and energy of the dance as well so the dance may not look hard-hitting, but it can be hard because of the dance complexity and the steps of the concept of the dance. <laughs> okay. Allow me to translate. Recently, I did some private React videos for my patrons. It's one of the perks you can get for being a patron of mine. One of the videos that Slayer chose to have me react to was K-pop dances. Now, the first video that he had me react to was called Hard Hitting Dances. So it was all like, like angled hard dance moves, like, boom, like juddering moves and things like that, okay? Then he had me react to another one, and I completely misread it. I thought it was a, a similar video to the first one. It actually wasn't. This video was difficult dances, but it was titled hard dances. So here I am watching it, and I'm like, oh, well, it doesn't seem so hard hitting. And that's the commentary I'm doing. Come to find out, I'm completely misunderstanding what the video was supposed to be because of the way that it had been titled. I really wish they had titled it more difficult dances. Then I probably would have understood it more. There were some really difficult moves. Like there was a move where all these guys were lying in a ring on the floor, but then they were actually using their force to pull each other up on a, in a ring. I had never seen anything like that before. And I, I called it out. I was like, that's not really hard hitting, but man, that's unique and interesting and different. And wow, that's, you know, that's got to be tough to do. So the funny part is, honestly, I can't really respond to the question because when I watched the video, I watched it with one thing in mind, completely misunderstanding it. If I were to rewatch that video again, you know, I think it was like a 15 minute long video. I would likely see it from a whole different perspective by level of difficulty rather than a level of how hard hitting the moves are. And therefore, I'd have some more to say. What I will say is, yeah, there was some interesting stuff. Definitely some stuff with choreography and synchronization. And some of the levels of stuff they were doing was, was unique and fun. Now, here's the thing. Compare that to American pop dancing. I can't. I, when I was growing up in the 90s and I used to watch MTV, right? My, I would watch some music videos, and usually it was the alternative rock, grunge, that kind of music. Um, and then there was, you know, Total Request, Total Request Live or TRL. This was the countdown show where everyday people would phone in. Yes, phone in because there was no internet voting at the beginning of this. What, what, you know, what videos you wanted to see? And I remember back then some of the, you know, the dance that you see, the Britney Spears or. The, or the Christina Aguilera or the Janet Jackson, you know, those were like the big dance videos. And yes, you had some dancing with the boy bands, but not as much, honestly. I don't think the boy bands were really the masters of dancing as much. They danced in their videos, but I think they were more about the stage shows were focused on dancing rather than their music videos. Um, I'm sure there was more than that, but the thing is, I didn't have exposure to it. I wasn't into that pop music stuff back then. So, you know, what was I listening to? Rock music, were they dancing in those videos? No. You know, Eminem and Dr. Dre, do they dance in those videos? No. 
So I am not really exposed to American dancing or anything like that to the point where I can really say, hey, I can do a direct comparison. I can tell you that this was improved from this and that. You know, I, I can't. I'm sorry. You know, you're asking. You're definitely barking down, barking up the or uh, you're, you're, you're looking up the, the wrong direction. Let's put it that way. I forgot the, the saying I wanted to use there. I combined like seven of them together. Um, I don't have that uh, reference, frame of reference, to really give you an intelligent answer on American dancing techniques versus Korean dancing techniques. But I do enjoy watching the videos that Slayer has me react to. It's different from something that I would normally watch. It's not definitely not in my level of expertise or comfort zone. I still find it entertaining. And I really enjoy those videos every month. So thank you, Slayer, for your ongoing support via Patreon. And also, thank you for, you know, the videos, the variety of videos you give me. It's not always K-pop stuff. He gives me a lot of other stuff, too, to react to. Case in point, his second question. My second question is another question based on your private react. After watching a video on the best and worst of each U.S. state, even though it is five years old and outdated, what's your impression after learning what each state is best and worst as a whole? Could you give examples to the viewers? No. Want to know why I can't give examples to the viewers? Because I don't really remember them. And you know what? This actually is my answer to the question. Slayer had suggested a channel, a YouTube channel to me. Many months ago. He said, you're doing React content now. Why don't you react to this channel for your viewers? This would be one to react to. So I ended up watching one distinct video I remember from the channel. And it was about something about like digging into the Earth's core and... You know, how deep had anyone ever d dug before, before they reached a limit where they couldn't go any deeper? <clears throat> what did they find and stuff like that? So I'm watching the video, and quite frankly, the video is fascinating. It is. It's fascinating. But at the same time, it's a little dry and boring. And what I mean by that is it's very factual, but it's not like by watching the video, it's like, wow, I, I'm blown away, I'm entertained, or anything like that. It seems like this cha YouTube channel is more like, if you really want to learn... um you know, facts about certain topics. They do some interesting videos about them. But it's not necessarily like, wow, I really want to go to this and just react to a ton of videos for this channel just because a lot of the topics are unrelated. And again, how much do you want to really learn, you know, scientifically or factually when, when you're watching someone do reacts online? You know what I mean? Like, I could see maybe every once in a while I do a video like that. But this isn't something that I could see myself doing. Hey, we're doing a react event today. And for five hours, I'm reacting to a channel that does scientific facts. It'd be like, what? Like, so I'll watch two videos, I'll go right to sleep, right? You know what I mean? Like, that's the kind of channel that you watch in your own time casually to learn stuff, but I don't think it would be anything that would be too good for React content. Just being honest, and you could disagree, but that was my take on it, all right? Now, what ended up happening was Slayer had me react to a completely different kind of video this channel had put out. This one, rather than going in-depth into something scientific, basically reviewed all 50 states in the United States, and said, what's like one, one of the best things about it and one of the worst things? Like, what are they known for as the best of and the worst of? And going through it, some of the stuff, I was shocked. I was like, how could that be? And other stuff, it was kind of like, well, that's interesting. But every time that this happened, here, here's honestly what I felt about the video. I kind of felt like it was a frivolous video that wasn't very good. And you could say, well, why? What was wrong with the video? Well, first of all, the video was five years old. And a lot of the things that they were saying in those videos... Likely today don't apply anymore because when COVID hit, the pandemic that is, uh, a lot of things changed here in the United States. A lot of things about employment, a lot of things about income, a lot of things about how jobs work, how businesses work. So you're looking at five-year-old stats that completely could have been flipped up on their own heads when when the, the pandemic happened, you see? So already the video kind of felt like it was totally not uh, almost like pertinent anymore. You know what I'm saying? Um, and then on top of that, what I also noticed was because of the nature of the video, this is a fast-moving video covering all 50 states. You can't really elaborate on any of it. This state is known for this is the best, but also they're the worst in this. Oh, on to the next state. Like, wait, 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 wait. Whoa, whoa, whoa. What about that? Why are they ranked like that? Can you give some data behind that? Can you elaborate? Nope. On to the next. On to the next. It almost becomes so so quick, you can't even... Like, I didn't have time to react to what they were saying in the video before they were already on to the next state. And it's like, wait, I didn't even absorb what you just said about that state. And now you're on to the next. And I think that's the nature of these videos where, the, oh, it's a countdown of all 50 states. It doesn't really work. That's too much information and no really elaboration on that information. You know what I'm saying? I don't think it works very well. So it's funny... 
because when this channel went too much into detail about one particular topic, I kind of felt like it was boring. Then when the channel went too fast and didn't elaborate because they were so fast moving to stay entertaining, then I felt it was kind of disappointing because you didn't really get your explanation for what they were saying. So it seemed like both kind of videos didn't really work. You know what I'm saying? Like, I don't know. And I, I guess this video is very, po this channel is very popular on YouTube and good for them. But for me, it just didn't seem very good. I don't know. And that's my take on it. And you could disagree. And that's fine. We all have different opinions. I just didn't really enjoy the content because it didn't feel like it was digestible enough for me. One was, it was too much information, too heavy information, too real, truthful, scientific information. Like reading the textbook with one video and the other video felt like fluff. There was no, like, in-between balance. You know what I'm saying? So there you go. Thank you, Slayer, for your questions. I hope you like those answers. We're about to move on to member questions from people who are channel members of DSP Gaming. But before we do that, we have a celebratory bubble blow for hitting 100 likes on today's Ask the King stream. Thank you all for that. Suck on this. If we happen to get another 100 likes, I'll do that again. Um, I do it for every 100 likes. We have well over 400 viewers on the stream today. We could definitely do it. By the way, I should say this. Thank you all. Recently, I've been getting a lot more viewers on my streams. And I don't know if that's necessarily a sign that I'm growing, a sign that people like me, or a sign that uh, there's a bunch of people like in the NSA, the FBI, the CIA who are watching the stream and they're building a case against me. You don't know. But anyway, thanks for the viewership. I appreciate the increase in views. Okay. Um... We got a couple other shout outs before we get to questions. There's a dollar tip here. From Colonel Sanders. Any new food you want to try from any restaurant? Uh, I'm not aware of I don't I don't follow fast food and stuff anymore. So I don't even know what's out there or new. You know, that's something I used to actively do for uh DSP tries it, but I haven't done that in a very long time. Um, you know, coming up we're gonna have our Super Bowl event. I'm definitely going to order some kind of pizza for that, but I don't know what. So I'll look into that when I get closer. But as of now, no. There's really no new food that's interesting me. Okay. I also have received an incredibly generous $40 tip from One Minute Man. One Minute Man with a doubled up tip today. Thank you so much, One Minute Man. That is very generous of you. I don't think anyone expected that. Right? One Minute Man always uh, does basically a $30 tip. Or excuse me, a $20 tip. Today, did a $40 tip. Thank you, One Minute Man. That is very, very nice of you. And with that, that gets us up to $96 in tips. So four more. And uh, we hit the vest goal. You guys can vote on a vest for me to wear for the show. All right? Shout out to JD who did a super chat. I'm watching this while at work. Well, you should probably be paying attention to your job so you don't lose it. But I hope that you're liking the show, JD. Thank you for the super chat. Okay. On to the, the next question. <clears throat> we now get to members questions. People who are channel members. All right? Our first question comes from Dimitri. If you can play only one game for the rest of your life, what game do you think you would pick? None. Because I am someone who gets entirely bored of the same thing over and over. For example, people say, if you had one food that you'd say is your absolute favorite food and you could have it forever, what would it be? I don't have an answer. I'd probably get bored of any food if I had it infinitely. You know what I'm saying? I'm a guy who likes variety. Therefore, I can tell you genres. In, in genres, fighting games, Super Street Fighter 2 Turbo. Platformers, Super Mario World. Uh, RPGs, top-down style, Legend of Zelda Link to the Past. JRPG style, probably either Final Fantasy 4, 6, or Chrono Trigger, and I'd have to decide between the three on only one game, and that's a tough decision for me. And I keep going on. You know what I mean? Like I keep telling you, oh, this is my favorite, this is my favorite, but <clears throat> I don't have one definitive game that I would play forever, I guarantee you I'd get bored of it if I only had one. There you go. Variety is the spice of life. Uh, Killings Pre 7 says, Are there any content creators you're familiar with you would like to collaborate with in any way or any favorites that you would just like to watch? What I would like to do eventually, all right, is not collaborate gameplay wise at all. That's my answer. No. I don't care about gameplay collaborations, right? I think that the whole collaborating and doing a playthrough collab or an online battle royale with a team is overrated. What I would like to do is eventually 
do some stuff. Maybe it could be a talk show. Maybe it could be interviews. Who knows? Where I interview other people on the internet, whether it's notable people, whether it's actual content creators, whatever it could be. I think that could be something interesting that I do. Um, so yes, there is. It's funny because everyone says, Phil, all the content you do is always you solo. It's always you solo talking to the camera. Are you ever going to do anything with anyone else? I would like to. And I have some ideas. All right. I'm, you know, there's stuff in the works. Let's put it that way. And uh, I'll let you know if and when stuff like that is going to happen. I think people would actually be fascinated by it because I never really done anything like that before. Right. But <clears throat> basically, right now, uh, I'm not ready to announce or say anything. But I would eventually like. But it's not going to be gameplay. I think that the gameplay shit is highly overrated. It's kind of, you know, people tune into DSP Gaming to see me play games. They don't really care about me collabing with other people at this point. It's been how many years since I did one? No one cares. But the thing is, as I'm branching out and doing other content, all right, that's real, really, really where I think things could get interesting, all right? As I said, I'm getting older. As I get older, I'm not just going to be a full-time gamer 24-7 anymore. I'm going to branch out. I'm going to broaden my horizons. I'm going to do different things. And as I do those different things, you know, that's when maybe I could start looking to do stuff with people outside of just me okay there you go uh linuli says is, is it very likely that pokemon scar oh it is very likely pokemon scarlet violet will have a dlc in june will you play that dlc will you do any unfinished post game stuff the thing with dlcs is for with me with me historically okay they're very hit or miss and what i mean by that is there have been some games where dlcs have been very successful such as the fallout series such as uh the Dark Souls slash FromSoft games. Usually when I play those DLCs, they do well. But in general, most games that I've ever went back to play a DLC with did not work. I don't know what it is, but it just seems like that initial interest for a game goes away after you've beaten the main game. And there just aren't a lot of people who are willing to come back to see us do, say, a second dose of a very similar game or the same game. Uh, case in point, Ghost of Tsushima was one of my biggest playthroughs of 2021. Was it 2021? And the DLC came out the next year in the summer, and I was stoked for it. I boot the sucker up. No one showed up. Everyone's saying, oh, it's just the same as the original game. I was like, well, what were you expecting? I was going to have guns flying through space. It's Ghost of Tsushima. You know, it's just more of the same, and I love that game. And people just didn't really show up for the DLC. They just were not very excited for it um, for whatever reason. So I feel like that's kind of a, a pattern with me. Now... Sometimes I've played Pokemon DLCs and they work. For example, when I played um, Pokemon Sword and Shield and then later on there were two different story expansions that happened that next year. I played them both and they both seemed to work. So maybe if there is a major uh, expansion for Pokemon and you guys have interest, maybe I will play it. It's up to you really. I would leave the ball in your court to determine if you want to see me uh, do it or not. Okay? Fair enough. So, thank you uh, for the suggestion. We'll see what happens. But for me, I'm not committing to anything like that. Okay? Uh, Pila asks, how are you avoiding game spoilers? The games that I want to play today always get ruined to me due to spoilers. Okay? Now, here's the thing. All right? In truth, I don't feel there is any 100% way to avoid spoilers on the internet. I just don't think there's a foolproof way. Okay? Just being honest. Okay? I don't think so. I don't think it's possible to, to insulate yourself. Unless you're living in a, in a, in a bunker on, underground. And you have no internet connection. Right? And you have no contact with anyone. How are you going to fully avoid spoilers? I don't think it's possible. Okay? It's just you're always going to have that risk factor involved. Where you, you know, you're going to get spoiled on a major game coming out. Okay? But... There's several things we have in place to try to prevent it. All right. First of all, do I have a social media? Yes, I do. But my social media is used for business purposes. And what I mean by that is do I follow game topics? I do, but I follow the major trends. I'm not following a lot of people who sit around and just talk about games they're playing. I'm following more professional sources, right? I'm following the feeds that are more of the mainstream gaming media, um, other trusted people who are independent journalists who don't necessarily post up big-ass spoilers and annoying things. You know what I'm saying? Basically, I, I, I'm not... Oh, I don't follow 20, 30, 40 people on Twitter 
who are going to sit there and say, yo, what about that twist in God of War when this happened? Like, no, I'm not. That would be really stupid. And I think the thing is, because I keep my social media professional, because I'm not following a bunch of my real life friends on there, right? Because I'm not in a situation where I'm exposed to that kind of discussion, I basically avoid it. That's a good thing. There's a lot of people who said they were spoiled on a lot of the twists and things in games recently. I was not spoiled because I don't follow those circles. I only use it for professional purposes. You know, when I open Twitter, I'm looking for professional, you know, official news stories and, and postings and game reviews and things like that. I'm not looking at the nonsense out there, people being, you know, spoiling everything. Now, here's the thing. It's, it's, it's not foolproof. When you're on a stream, at any moment, some dickhead could come in here and try to spoil a game. And, you know, what I do in general, I rule of thumb where there's people who try to spoil shit for me. And if I, I'm reading something and all of a sudden there's a giant paragraph out of nowhere, I kind of tend to know that probably that's because they're probably posting up a bunch of shit, right? Take a look at all the chat right now. It's just a bunch of people saying a little phrases here or there. And that's fine. That's exactly what you expect in a live stream chat. If all of a sudden there's a giant fucking paragraph in the chat, probably it's bullshit. It's something you don't want to look at for good reason, right? You know, we got mods that help. They do their best to try to stop spoilers. The other thing is, uh, with game spoilers in general, what's really funny about them is a lot of them aren't necessarily true because games are an interactive medium. I'm going to give you an example of the biggest game spoiler I ever got that ended up not being true, okay? <clears throat> so when Grand Theft Auto V came out, I want to say it was probably the second stream I had ever done of the game. We had a group of trolls coming into the chat, and they were spamming... Um, so-and-so dies at the end. And I can't remember who it was. Was it My Mike? Who's the main characters? There's Trevor. There, is it Mike? I can't even remember the names of the characters anymore in that game. But basically they were saying, this one particular, Michael, right? They were saying, Michael dies at the end. And they were spamming this in the chat to try to ruin it. And everyone in the chat was so upset. It's Michael, Trevor, and Franklin. Thank you, literally. I forgot all their names. I only remember Trevor because he's the nut job, right? So... Basically, you know, everyone got pissed, right? We were like, oh, man, because it, we really didn't want to have the spot spoil. This is going to be an ongoing playthrough that was probably going to be one of my biggest, most epic ones I'd ever done. When I was playing it, I was getting like 1,000 viewers a stream. It was crazy, right? And then, basically, we're like, the whole plot just got ruined. And I said to everyone, I said, listen, do me a favor. Don't believe it. Because even if it's true... We've got a giant journey to go through to determine how it's even going to happen. What's more important is the story up to that point. Not the resolution, not how it ends, but what happens in between. Bear with me. Let's see how this game ends for real. And if that happens, it happens. We got spoiled. Big deal. But let's enjoy the journey. And it took me like a long time to beat the game. Probably a couple weeks or whatever. And finally, when we get to the end, guess what happened? Michael's fucking didn't die. It was bullshit. Basically, these idiots came in because there's multiple endings. So they give you one possible thing that could happen. Yeah, any of the three main characters can die in that game, and any of them can survive based on your choices in the game. So, what a dumb spoiler, right? It was completely pointless. And that's what I mean. Like, that was the biggest, probably the biggest spoiler for me that ever happened, and it didn't really matter. So now, whenever a spoiler comes in or whatever, I don't believe it. I'm like, you know what? Half the time you're getting half information. You're getting one piece that doesn't make sense until you play the whole game. You won't even understand said spoiler, right? There are situations that are exceptions to that. I mean, look, look at Last of Us 2 and how badly The Last of Us 2 got spoiled on the internet, right? Like, everyone knew. Everyone knew what the plot of the game was going to be, and that's why everyone was so pissy about the game when it came out. <clears throat> I don't know how these companies are having all this shit leak so early, except that they're basically giving their early copies to the wrong people. They really are, you know? That's the, that is the double-edged sword of giving out early review copies. If it's not in the right hands, you could have someone who's completely irresponsible and then leaks the whole major plot of your story, and the next thing you know, your whole game's spoiled. <clears throat> and that's terrible, you know? I don't want to be spoiled on, on games at all. I don't want to know anything ahead of time. Like I have told you guys, one of the things that I love the most about games is that I don't spoil myself. When a game is coming out... Oh, I'll give you a perfect example on this one. Hogwarts Legacy, all right? So... I've been following Hogwarts Legacy for a couple of years. I know it exists. I know basically the basics of what you can do in the game. I have not followed <clears throat> any of the recent information about the game. I'm, I'm actually committing a blackout for myself. Why? Because I don't want to be spoiled. When I play the game, 
I want to be delighted at the interesting gameplay elements and the fun things that are in the game. I don't want to boot the game up already knowing everything that's in it and having a checklist and saying, hmm, when is this thing that was promised going to happen? Is it here? Not yet. Okay, what about... Oh, there's this one. Check that one off. Where's this one? That's not fun. That's not fun at all. You want to be able to play a game and enjoy it and discover it at face value, not having preconceived notions of what's in it, what's expected of it. And if you're sitting there and you're watching 20-minute gameplay blowout, you know, one-hour development interview talking about all the aspects of the game, why are you doing that? Right? Why are you spoiling the game for yourself? Why are you researching everything about that game before it's out? So now when it comes out, why are you even... How could you even enjoy it? You know what I'm saying? That really gets to me. And then there's some games that really get me. I start playing it, and the game has a bad tutorial, so you don't understand the elements. And everyone yells at me, oh, well, why didn't you look up the game before it came out to know how to play it? Like, what? Why didn't I look up the game before it came out to know how to play it? Do you even understand the purpose of a video game? The purpose of a video game is supposed to be a creative medium to portray something artistic and, a, and some level of entertainment factor. If I have to do hours of research to enjoy something, then it's not the kind of entertainment I'm looking for, you know? So that's what I mean. Like, I want to stay oblivious to what's going to happen because if you do, then you can actually get those genuine moments of wonder and joy and shock and surprise and, whoa, I didn't know that was in the game. Wow, that's cool. I didn't know that was going to happen. Wow, what a twist in the plot. If you do all this preconceived research and, and everything, how on earth... Are you going to enjoy that game at face value how it was intended to be enjoyed? I think a lot of people just ruin this for themselves these days. And I don't know why they do that. I, I, I think the modern gamer today is a lot different than who I was growing up. You know, I, I don't want to know every aspect of everything. I try to avoid it. And again, I do my best, but you can't always. You can't always avoid spoilers. But you do your best, right? Okay. All right, fair enough. Let's continue on. Our next question here, by the way, we're about a half an hour in. Cool, we still got about another half an hour before I have to take a break. Sounds good to me. Our next question is from another channel member by the name of One Minute Sam. Sounds a little familiar. And they answered the following. I have got a question for you. Hold on, because I have to ban an idiot. Okay. I'm glad you have a question, One Minute Sam, because that's what the show is for. Says, Given a significant amount of AAA games that are now on average starting to get longer, have you thought of a different way in which that you can structure your streams? I understand you're a variety streamer, but I do think that you could still be considered a variety streamer while playing more of a game if it's played in a shorter time frame. <clears throat> Excuse me. I'm just thinking of your Game of the Year Awards winner, God of War Ragnarok, as an example. That is a brilliant game, no doubt, but I felt disinterested in it due to the playthrough dragging on over two months after its release. Yeah, here's the thing. <clears throat> All right? Being a variety content creator is a double-edged sword, for sure, all right? Because here's the positives and negatives. There's one really humongous, overpowering positive, and then there's a couple of negatives, all right? The overpowering positive is that being a variety content creator, you will entertain a wide audience, you will retain a wide audience, and you will have people coming in from all walks of life, all over the world to enjoy and support your content, all right? As they say, I'm a jack of all trades. You can come to DSP Gaming right now for Ask the King, tonight for Warzone Battle Royale, tomorrow all day for Survival Horror, Saturday for a JRPG, and then a Western RPG in Oblivion, and then we do it all again on Sunday. We, we, we go back to, you know, re resetting everything again. Do you see what I'm saying? Um. So... It's kind of interesting, right? It is kind of interesting Do, being that. And the thing is, I honestly feel like many years ago, if I had not decided to be a variety content creator, if I decided I'm going to focus in on a certain genre, a certain type of game, a certain focus, I would not be here today. I firmly believe that I would have become a relic of the past. While all my contemporaries from 15 years ago have seemed to have faded into obscurity, no one talks about them anymore in many cases, I'm still here. I'm tiny now. I'm not some big big shot anymore, but I'm able to have a viewership, a supportive viewership, by the way, and I'm able to make a living and have a good time putting out the content that I want to put out. And that's a unique thing in the modern day, you know? 
Why? Because of variety. If I decided to be the Street Fighter 4 player, if I decided to be the survival horror guy, if I decided I was just going to play open RPGs, you know what I'm saying? If I become an expert or, or one little thing, that would have kind of, I feel, pigeonholed me to the point where I would have become irrelevant at one point. All right? Now, here is the double-edged sword of being a variety content creator. Okay? First of all, when you're a variety content creator... You're a jack of all trades, but a master of none, right? People come here to relax and watch a variety of games, but they're not coming here for any level of expertise. And what ended up happening was there's certain things over the years that I feel people did like, and they don't, they don't come here for it anymore, right? No one is coming to DSP Gaming to watch me play Street Fighter. I'm being honest. They don't. I mean, Street Fighter is good when I can put it in as a variety of the stuff that I do. You're not getting people from the fighting game community coming to watch Dark Side Phil play Street Fighter. In fact, I would argue the vast majority of people who watch me play fighting games are non-FGC viewers. They don't watch other streams of FGC. They're pretty much oblivious to that. They just like watching me do a fighting game for variety. I lost that audience because I had it once. When Street Fighter 4 came out, I was huge for Street Fighter 4. And I lost that over time being a variety content creator. All right. The other thing is, because I'm a variety content creator, when it comes to a point when there's a giant game, right? Here comes Elden Ring. Here comes God of War. Here comes a new Grand Theft Auto. Here comes a new ultimately hyped game that everyone wants to see me play, right? Correct? Well, guess what happens? I'll play it, but I have to balance it with other games. Because I recognize that I have an audience that likes variety. They're not here just to watch the one game. And if I decide, oh, I want to get so far in this one game that I'm just going to sit here and play it almost nonstop for weeks on end, I will dramatically, <clears throat> dramatically lose my audience. Do you understand? I will. I know I will. For example, <clears throat> tomorrow is Dead Space Remake. I'm going to play Dead Space Remake all day long tomorrow. But then immediately on Saturday... I have to mix it up. If I did three to four streams in a row, we would absolutely lose that viewership. People would, would, oh my God, I wanted Elder Scrolls. Man, where's the continuation of One Piece? Why is he not doing Warzone? I love Warzone. You know, people are here for various different reasons. And I can't make everyone happy all of the time, but I can do my best to make people happy in pieces over time. You see what I'm saying? Now, when it comes to a game like God of War Ragnarok, it's kind of like you're damned if you do, and you're damned if you don't. When God of War Ragnarok came out, you may not realize this, I did play it for several days in a row. I had it as the main... I, I think I played it all day the first day. I had it as the mainstream, like, f several times that first week. And basically what ended up happening was after, like, two, three days of it, the attendance dropped off, people were bored, and wanted me to do variety again. Take a look at Elden Ring. Elden Ring, I played nonstop for a day or two, and then I actually kept it some weeks as the mainstream every single day, all right? In that case, were we able to retain some viewership and support every day? We were, but it dramatically dipped after a while, you know? And then I had to say, okay, Elden Ring certainly cannot be mainstream every day. We have to balance this with other games and other things that you guys want. You know what I'm saying? So that's the thing. Like, being a variety content creator, I can't do what a lot of other content creators do. I'm well aware that a lot of other creators will get a game that's a big-ass AAA game, and they'll just sit there and they'll play that game endlessly for two, three weeks till they beat it, right? A game like God of War that was 60 hours, a game like Elden Ring over 100 hours, they sit there and they just play it nonstop. That would actually isolate and annoy a giant chunk of my audience. And listen, I get it. Because in the case of me playing games like that, I actually really want to play more of them. Case in point, God of War. I was craving playing more God of War Ragnarok at some points. There were days, sometimes it was two, three days before I got to play it again. Like, man, we're in the middle of a story. I just want to keep going. But no, people want the variety. So that's the trade-off of being the variety content creator. I will have longevity. I will always have something to play. But at the same time, I don't really have that flexibility to say, I'm putting my foot down just to play the same game for three weeks to beat it. Then then that will be the end of my viewership. People will leave in droves. 
and say, sayonara, I'll play what you want, but we're going to come back when you decide to do variety again. You know, that's, that's the nature of the beast. Okay. And you might say, well, what can you do to fix that? The only thing I can do to fix that is try to balance it a little better with God of War. Originally I did play it more. And then when, the, when immediately within two, three days, the viewership tapered off, people were like, ah, we want other stuff. I, I mixed it. I listened to your feedback. Ultimately, the only way to do it is to listen to feedback. And as for as many people that were upset that it took me so long to beat God of War, there were an ego amount of people that definitely would have not been here if I just played God of War. You see? There's no real, oh, here's the golden solution or the golden balance to anything. All I can do is always play it by ear, try to take in your feedback, try to understand from your own designs and your own... Uh, feelings about what we're doing the vibes that are generated on a stream what do people think about this or that do i play it more do i play it less right that, that's all i can do and i hopefully over the years i've gotten better at that you know there was a time many years ago when i would take on so many games at once i play it like once a week how on earth am i supposed to make any kind of progress in a game when i'm playing it for three to four hours a week only that will take months to beat. That was the Dragon Age Inquisition problem. Where I had Dragon Age Inquisition and like seven other games I was playing. And none of them got finished for two, three months. By the time that it was done, everyone was pissed. Like literally every person, you know. So all I could do is do my best to balance it out. And also to taper off expectations. When I started playing God of War Ragnarok, I fully made it unknown to everyone. It's going to take me forever to beat this game. It's so long and there's so much else going on at this time of year that you guys want to see. I have to balance and therefore it will take a while Please be patient. And in general, people were. And I was very pleased that people were as patient as they were. Okay? So there's no definitive answer here. I wish there was one minute, Sam. There just isn't. You know what I'm saying? Um, I wish that there was not Oh, here's the end-all answer for everything. Right? Now, by the way, um, I think one minute Sam had continued on. Let's see what else they had to say. I feel like this is something that certainly will affect negatively the way in which your streams are supported and potentially even your channel growth. I feel a shorter time frame for games and more of a gameplay within that time frame is a better for engagement. Support for those games would be more consistent and more importantly, a backlog of games doesn't occur where games are finally getting played. Only they came out a week or two ago and they're going to take weeks or months to finish and cre creates a cycle. I appreciate the change in direction of your channel. Keep up the great work, Phil. So again, yeah, that pretty much, I didn't read his whole question, which is kind of my bad. Um, basically what he's saying, I agree with. I just wish that there, there is no solution for a lot of these games, you know? Um, I do my best to, to I would have played more God of War probably that first week if more people had attended, more people had said they wanted more of it. But actually what happened was the attention had dipped off. So if attention is dipping off on a major playthrough and people want variety, I'm going to give them the variety they want. You know, Elden Ring did actually retain pretty good viewership and support for about a month. And after the month, then it died. And then I started balancing it with other stuff because definitely the support was going, woo! And people were telling me it was they were bored of it. Which I don't blame them, because you get to that second half of the game, you've pretty much seen the whole game already, besides the final bosses. <clears throat> so, yeah. Anyway, thank you, One Minute Sam, for the question. I hope that, I mean, I wish I had a better answer for you. Like, oh yeah, this is how I'll tackle it in the future. Really, it's a play it by your attitude. Gauge your audience, ju judge from your audience what they want. If they're loving a game, you play more of it. If they don't, play less of it, right? What can you do? All right, I received a $4 tip. From Alex. I hope my tips are going through now. This one has, Alex. Yes. So thank you, Alex, for a $4 tip. And with that tip, we have hit our $100 tips goal for the stream today. Which indeed means you guys can vote for a vest here on Ask the King. I know you guys are very excited about that. Thank you, Alex, for that $4 tip. Let's, uh, let's do a poll quickly. Which vest is Q&A best? Let's do the McFly vest. Let's do the original beige vest. Let's do the gold vest. And let's do the denim vest. There we go. Good variety of vests for you to vote on today. Very nice. Kagome, I will see you for Warzone tonight. All right. Purple Pickle, yum yum, did a super chat. Howdy McCree, yeehaw. Pfft. <laughs> Uh, I think I'm far from any kind of Overwatch character, but thank you very much. Pur purple Pickle purple pickle Yum Yum for the Super Chat. Okay. 
Let's continue. We still have a ways to go before the break. About another 15 minutes. Cool. Our next question is from Guitar Player 1939. He says, you know, I started playing Persona 5 recently, and I'm really enjoying it, but, you know, I just don't like the school slash life simulator part of the game. What's your opinion on games that take it this route? Well, here's the thing. We have plenty of games out there that go the more fantasy route. And when I say fantasy, I really feel like there's two realms of fantasy that RPGs technically usually go in. One side of the equation, it'll go towards typical fantasy style medieval dragons and swords and magic and we have five zillion rpgs that play just like that correct and then i would say the other direction that they tend to go is more futuristic oh it's sci-fi with aliens and technology and spaceships and laser guns and things like that so those are really the two fantasy directions right more old school medieval more futuristic sci-fi the persona series says to hell with all of that nonsense. That's all sucks. How dare you even do that stuff? It's so cliche and trite. Instead, we're going to do today. We're going to try to make it as if this fantasy game is set in the present day. Real people from Japan. Real life, right? How an actual teenager growing up would experience life. Going to school, having relationships with other teenagers as well as adults. It's kind of unique with some of the social links and things you do in the Persona franchise or how you have a relationship with an adult as opposed to an other teenagers, right? <clears throat> it's kind of unique in that in that regard. I think it kind of started in the 1990s, if you think back, um, maybe the Mother series, like, like Earthbound, started off having that more modern take. And then what Persona did was made it more realistic, less comedy, although there's a lot of comedy in it, and having a lot more of that drama aspect, right? So if you like the idea of almost a, a Japanese youth, you know, life simulator... You get that, but you also get your turn-based fantasy-style JRPG combat mixed in there as well, right? Now, if that's not your cup of tea and you don't like that, there's tons of other RPGs out there for you. The thing is, they're going to be more main in line with what you would expect of medieval fantasy or sci-fi fantasy, and you don't really see that people dabble too much farther outside of those realms, right? <clears throat> um... Especially when it comes to JRPGs, because JRPGs usually tend to fall into certain archetypes for how the games are played, with the combat styles and, and magic and, and or that kind of stuff. Um, <clears throat> the other game franchise that I would say recently that did this, but did not do it with kids, Yakuza. Yakuza Like a Dragon. That's all adults, but it's turn-based RPG. It's based in Japan. If you don't want the teen angst drama, but you still want a lot of, of cool plot lines and stuff, that's probably the game you want to go for then. Okay? So that's my recommendation and guitar player. I hope that you enjoy Persona, despite the fact that those kids can be darned angsty at times. Okay? Our next question is from John Smith. What a unique name. Thank you, John, for the question. He says, It concerns the approach to game design. I've recently been playing through Zelda games, and I took note of the Nintendo's insistence on pushing the series forward with new and unexplored features. My question is as follows. What does being inventive and trying to push a series forward cross over... Oh, when does being inventive and trying to push a series forward cross over into being so somewhat gimmicky? As an addendum, in your opinion, what is the right approach to being inventive and are pushing a series forward? Should a game completely reinvent itself with every entry into a series, or should it include things that worked well from the past? You know, <clears throat> Zelda is a great series to ask this question on. Because it does feel like, with different generations of Zelda that it keeps trying to reinvent itself in different ways. The original Zelda was a top-down adventure game with RPG elements. The sequel was a side-scrolling action game with RPG elements. They feel completely different. Zelda 1 and Zelda 2 don't even feel like you're playing the same game, right? <clears throat> but after Zelda 2 being an experiment, I guess Nintendo felt like it kind of failed because then for Zelda Link to the Past, they went back, down, back to the top-down back to that kind of formula but what is they did is they advanced the engine they now have better graphics more interesting puzzles and aspects to the gameplay that weren't part of the original zelda game almost as if they had undone the changes they had done in zelda 2 to go back to its roots hence link to the past but also advance it with better graphics better music and interesting new gameplay advancements right then all of a sudden the n64 comes out like oh my god it doesn't even feel like Zelda anymore. For people who had played the previous Zelda games, Zelda 64, I mean, really, the only thing it really it, it retains is some of the enemy types. Outside of that, 
it's a totally new franchise. It feel, and that's what I didn't like about Zelda 64 was I loved Link to the Past. And when I was playing Zelda 64 on N64, I was like, this doesn't feel anything like Link to the Past. Like, it just feels so dramatically different that I don't even know if you could call it Zelda. But, of course, what ended up happening was a whole new generation was now exposed to Zelda as a new kind of game. And people loved it. And that became the new standard for what Zelda was. <clears throat> right? Now, take a look at Majora's Mask. Majora's Mask took the formula from Zelda 64 and changed it again. A time manipulation time loop mechanic. A game that's more based on puzzles and masks than actual, you know, I would say combat gameplay. Although combat is a big part of it. Um, it's unique again, right? Another unique take on it. And then they just kept doing this. You know, Wind Waker is different. You know, uh, Skyward Sword is different. Twilight Princess is, is different. Each one pushed forward something new and interesting. However... However, yes, I called it Zelda 64 instead of Ocarina of Time because I, know, I think all N64 games are called 64. I grew up during that era. They, they, still, call, they still call it like Doom, uh, Superman 64, Killer Instinct 64, even though it's Killer Instinct 2 or Killer Instinct Gold. Mortal Kombat 64, it was actually MK Ultimate, but everyone says it. Everyone called it everything 64 back then. So I called them all 64 because I cannot grow. I have to say I have 64. Anyway. <laughs> um, the one that I think they went too far was definitely Skyward Sword. And if you watch my playthrough of it from back in the day, I strongly criticize Skyward Sword. Why? Because they turned it into like a motion control gimmick. And here's the thing. If you want to add new gameplay elements, turn Zelda from top down to 2D side scrolling. Okay? Turn Zelda from top down to a 3D open world. Turn it from 3D open world to masks with puzzles. Now you have an exploration mechanic where everything's water. Turn it into... You know what I mean? I keep going on with all the gimmicks of the Zelda franchise over the years. The one that stands out to me that did not work was the motion control. I can tell you definitively, Skyward Sword is a better game without the motion controls. Because I played the one without the motion controls, and I liked it a lot better. I was actually very much enjoying it, being able to accurately control my combat, being able to roll the bombs the way that you want to solve the puzzles. It is so much better. That whole motion control gimmick of the Wii era was literally that. It was, let's cash in on something because people who don't usually play these games are now playing them. Let's try to get them hooked, right? And I don't think it worked because if Miyamoto himself is on stage at E3 and he can't play the game, then how do you expect me to play, right? I hated the motion controls of Skyward Sword. It was the one thing I didn't like about the game. Everything else about the game I thought was great. It's the stupid motion controls. They really misstepped there with that one. All right? And that's where it goes from from innovation to gimmick, right? It really is. You know, Breath of the Wild, my God, changes a lot about Zelda. Number one, having a huge open world that was 3D with exploration and traversal and all of that. I mean, yes, they had done that previously in games like the old Zeldas where you had an open world, right? But that was top down. This is like full 3D platforming, parkour, and everything. It was a different take on Zelda. And in addition, the combat being so different, right? The dungeons no longer being these dungeons, but instead kind of like puzzles that led to boss fights. You know, there's a lot they changed in Breath of the Wild, but it worked because it kind of appealed to what a modern gamer was looking for, things that had already worked in other game franchises, fi finally modernizing Zelda to make it feel like Nintendo said, we want to catch up with other games. That was a good thing. You know, you don't always want to be so unique and out there weirdo in a different direction that now people lose touch with your game franchise and don't even want to play it anymore because they feel it's annoying. And maybe that's what was happening with Zelda to some extent, right? I don't know, but I'm happy that they kind of went in that direction. I'm actually excited to see what they do with this follow up now. What's it called? Tears of uh, Tears of the Investors. Is that what it's called? <laughs> the Legend of Zelda. Tears of the game developers who had to make another one on Switch. Went instead of a better modern con game console. There you go. Whatever it's called. I don't even remember what it's called. Tears of the... Tears of... Tear is it Tears? Does it have something to do with Tears? What's the name of this game? Tears of the Kingdom. Why is the whole kingdom crying? What is... What, what happened in Breath of the Wild that everyone's crying? The whole kingdom is sad now. What happened? <laughs> or maybe it's Tears of Joy. Tears of Joy... 
that finally there's a new Zelda game. Oh, yes, it's the stream. <coughs> All the salty tears coming down our faces. Oh, Zelda. I don't know. Wait, it's Tear? It's Tears of the Kingdom? Seriously? I thought it was Tears of the Kingdom. It's Tears of the Kingdom? It is? What tour? No, they confirmed it's tear like crying. They did confirm that. Okay. So the whole game, there's going to be a giant pool of salty tears everyone's cry crying into. And you drink from the delicious tears. Ganon, he gets a big, he's like a straw. He's like, oh, I love your tears. <laughs> I don't know what this game is about. I guess we're going to find out. Anyway. Do we have time for one more? I guess we have to, actually, people want the Mc, Marty McFly vest today. So let's do that. Let's do the Marty McFly vest quickly. Maybe we'll answer one more question, then we'll go on to, ah, oh, my foot. Oh, ow. I ran my foot into my table. Oh, that hurt a lot. Okay, let me get the Marty McFly vest on one foot. Ah, ooh. Man, if only I were wearing my Back to the Future shirt today. With this vest, it would be the full ensemble. All right. <laughs> All right. One final question, and then we'll go on a break. This question is from Golden Colts Backup. Actually, you know what? We have two questions because they're completely related. We'll ask them back to back, and then we'll go on break. The first question is from Golden Colts Backup. What happened to regular... Golden Colts, what happened to your first account? Why do you have a backup? It's confusing. Anyway, Golden Colts Backup asks, do you have a guilty pleasure game you enjoy, even though the majority of people do not like it, but you personally enjoy it? Yes. Gotcha games. I love spending my entire life's fortune on gotcha games. Every day, I'm clicking, I'm pulling, I can't wait for the big win, and there goes my life savings, and there goes my livelihood. Okay, obviously I'm being stupid there in line with the dumb detracting me. No. Um, it's funny because... In reality, when you think about the games that I play today, I don't really have time to play that much anymore. I just do everything on stream, right? I don't. I tell you guys, I don't play games off stream. You know, I spend so much time in this office playing games that I don't feel that I want to play games outside of this office. I'm being honest. Like, I love games. It's my hobby as well as my job. But I feel like if I'm going to play games, I'd like to share them with you guys. I don't feel the need to play games outside of this room to experience fun. Like, I actually feel like I want to do other stuff. If I'm not here, I want to have some good food with my wife. I want to watch a television show or watch her play a game or watch someone else play a game. But you know what I'm saying? Like, the last thing I want to do if I'm, if I'm sitting here playing games all day is leave and go play more games. That's, you know, I like, again, I'm the kind of guy that likes variety. You know, so a guilty pleasure game, honestly, no, not really. I don't feel that there's like a guilty pleasure game for me because I don't think I, I don't play games outside of what I do on stream. And what, what, what would you consider a guilty pleasure that I go and play super turbo every once in a while? I love street fighter. I want to play old school street fighter. Is that really a guilty pleasure? I'm not guilty. I don't feel guilty for playing the classics, you know? So no, I don't think I have a guilty pleasure game. Maybe if there was one game that only I liked and I demanded you guys watch me play it. But no, I, I don't really feel that there's a game out there that's not liked that I just like keep playing over and over and over. No, I don't think so. All right? Now, to follow up on that question, Steak Sandwich asked a question. Are there any movies or TV shows you really like that are guilty pleasures? Shameful to admit you like it. If so, what movie or show? Well, what I've said is I, I, have, I think there's a series of movies out there that I've enjoyed over time, that I feel that they're so bad that they're good. So, for example, the Super Mario Brothers live-action movie from the 1990s, and now the funny part is I have to start saying that, because in a few months, there actually is another Super Mario Brothers movie coming out that's actually CGI. So I can't just say the Super Mario Brothers movie anymore, because people will say, oh, yeah, that movie was great. No, I have to say, the Super Mario Brothers live-action movie from the 1990s starring 
Bob Hoskins and John Linguizamo and Dennis Hopper. I have to say that. If I don't, people won't believe me, right? So anyway, um, the reason that I like that movie is because it is so bad. It is so completely not in the spirit of what the game is. It is so off base. It is like, here's an example of how you can take an idea and give it to Hollywood and see how Hollywood can completely and utterly destroy that idea, right? Change it into something completely different, right? It's still, I enjoy watching it. It's bad. It's a bad movie, but it has so many cringe moments. It has so many weird moments and lines. It's still good. You can still enjoy it at face value for watching such an oddity. I remember going to the movie theater with my dad and seeing it live because we paid to see this in the theater and walking on looking at each other like, what did we just see? You know, my dad knew what Super Mario Brothers was. He'd watch me play it. He's like, what was that? I don't know. I really don't know. You could have called that anything else. It, I really didn't have anything to do with Super Mario Brothers, right? You could have called it Everyone Do the Dinosaur. And I think it would have been more accurate to what the game was. Or what the movie was, excuse me. You know? So, anyway, that's one. The other one is definitely the Street Fighter movie. Okay? The Street Fighter movie that came out in the 1990s starring Jean-Claude Van Damme. Um... Again, a movie that really does not touch upon the spirit of what the games were. But a movie that tried to some extent. Failed miserably, but at least it tried. Um, it's just another so bad it's good movie. Where the lines are terrible. The acting is terrible. The action is quite terrible. <laughs> but I don't know why. When I watch it, I love it. I, I love that movie. It's bad. It's a bad, bad movie. But I watch it and I, I, I smile. I don't know. Maybe it's just a, it's a it's a that whole Super Mario Brothers Street Fighter era was such a unique era because video games were starting to become very popular and profitable, but no one actually knew how to convert that into other forms of media. Today, we've got examples like this Last of Us TV show. We've got successful movies like the Sonic movies. We're about to have a Super Mario movie where it looks like these things will cross over successfully. And now, video games have become mainstream media. But back then, Seriously, it was such so different. These million, million, millions of dollars wasted on this stuff. And then to go back and watch it today and be like, holy crap, this is what I watched when I was a kid, right? <laughs> it's pretty insane. Anyway, those would be my guilty pleasure movies, I would say. Okay? Um, Some Super Chats have come in. Purple Pickle Yum Yum with another Super Chat talking about wings. I, you know, I have nothing to do with him. I'm staring at the wall to the Super Chat. Would you reuse the Dark Souls 1 eventually? Yes, I would at some point. Purple Pickle Yum Yum does another Super Chat. Are you can you have to stay longer if we donate? I mean, I shout out donations, so technically yes, but I could just choose to answer or shout these out after a break. Speaking of which, guess what? It's time for a break. So thank you all for watching part one of Ask the King. I think today we will only do one break, and we will actually do the rest of the show. When we come back, there's three more questions from members. We got patron shout outs. We got a good amount of forum questions. And then we have some Twitter questions. So I think what we'll do, we'll take a break. If you're watching this on demand on YouTube, just watch part two. It's a separate video. If you're actually watching this as a live stream, I'm going to take about a 15 minute break now to stretch my legs and, you know, relax a bit and come right back and finish the show for you guys. Okay. So thank you all. Great stream so far. Great interactions. Great support. We appreciate everything. And I'll see you all after this brief break. Thank you. And I'll be back in just a bit. <laughs> 